me start the story with giving you a little insight into my background because knowing what perspective I come from uh, will speak into how I got to where I am today. I grew up in um, East Arkansas on a farm and come from three generations of farmers. And just like most of us that grow up in any type of environment, we think it's the worst place you could ever grow up and you try your best to get away. So uh, my dad maybe worked me too hard on the farm, but I, I did what I could to get away and ended up going to school in Texas. Got an accounting degree and started my career at KPMG, one of the big four accounting firms um, in the country. And ended up um, getting a CPA. And in 2005, found myself in Little Rock working for a private equity fund, pretty content with my career, had a young family, and uh, was um, on my path to the suburban prosperity we all think is the answer to our uh, happiness. I got a random phone call in the fall of 2005 from an acquaintance, uh, a gentleman I barely knew, and he asked me, um, he said, uh, would you consider moving your family with mine and start a microfinance bank in Rwanda? And my initial thought was, I don't know where Rwanda is. I don't know what microfinance is. I think it's a bad place. I got two kids. I'm not interested. But uh, to make a very long story short, nine months later, my family and I were on the ground in Rwanda. And we spent two years over there struggling to start a microfinance bank. Microfinance bank is where you make loans to the poor. And those were the two best years and, and uh, two hardest years of, of uh, my career and, and life, just uh, seeing the world from a different perspective. But uh, we, we got the bank off the ground. You know, we didn't really know what we were doing, obviously, coming from Arkansas, uh, having backgrounds in banking in the U.S. Um, but we were uh, maybe uh, cavalier enough and crazy enough to be the pioneers to get it off the ground. The good news is we put it in the hands of people that know what they're doing now, and it's the most successful microfinance bank in Rwanda today. And uh, all of our employees at our, our coffee business now have accounts there. So it's kind of nice to have seen it um, take off. But um, um, that's where I came from. And then in 2009, I heard I was actually living in Memphis, had moved back, had taken a job there, just bought a house, just got settled after this time in Africa, was, had a job in Memphis and happy there, and heard that uh, some businessmen in Little Rock that I knew were thinking about getting in the coffee business in Rwanda. And I was actually traveling through Little Rock for uh, work, and I called up uh, and said, tell me what you're going to do here um, in coffee, because I was really excited after just being out of Rwanda for a year. I knew who they were talking to, and I knew they were in for quite a, a shock to know what it was like to do business on the other side of the world. So I went over to visit with them, and, and uh, within about two minutes, I was invited to start this little journey with them of a coffee business in Rwanda. So I called my wife. We had just moved into a house. I said, you want to move again, move back home, and get back involved in Rwanda? She was a trooper, said yes. And so we started West Rock Coffee. And the way we started it is we started it basically with um, uh, trying to figure out how could we make a difference over there. And pretty quickly, we saw there were really two main exporters of coffee. And I'll tell you a little bit more about what exporting coffee means. But it was a, it was a market situation where there actually needed to be a little bit uh, more people competing for coffee from the farmers. In Rwanda, there are no plantations. There's no big farms. Mainly, um, these are small holder farmers that may have an area not even as big as this room, maybe a quarter of the size of this room that have 20 to 50 to 100 trees that pick the coffee cherries off the trees and um, bring those to a local washing station. And that's the only cash they may actually earn for the year is picking the cherries off the tree. And so we saw an opportunity to come in and be a, a, a competitive force and try to help with some of the inefficiencies in what we saw on the ground. And so we bought a coffee mill that had been bankrupt. It was dilapidated. We refurbished it. And uh, we started exporting coffee with really, honestly, just barely knowing how to spell coffee at the time. So it was, <laughs> it was quite an adventure. I wanted to show you these four pictures here. And they tell a little bit of story about the coffee process. If you look up in the top left, these are two women. These are both um, coffee farmers. And they are sorting cherries um, that they have picked from the trees earlier in the day. What they're doing, they're sorting the the underripe and the overripe to get to the sort of, to choose the best cherries to be processed. Those cherries have a seed inside, that's what we call the coffee bean, and that is removed and washed and fermented overnight before the bean, which still has a husk around it, and that is referred to in the trade as parchment. That parchment is laid out on tables and dried for three weeks. 
The women on the right are farmers, members of a cooperative. They come out every day and turn that parchment over to be dried for about three weeks as, it lay, as it's in the fields next to these washing stations. So that's even before it ever gets to the mill. These, these um, farmers have, have touched these beans on a daily basis to get them to in a position where they actually can even be processed. Ultimately, when they get to a certain moisture level, they're brought into our coffee mill in the capital, Kigali, in Rwanda, and they're milled. We have a machine that removes the husk. We have tables that are uh, shaped at an angle, they're called gravity tables, separates the coffee the, for, by density, the heaviest falls to the bottom, the light on the top. And then we have this really fancy machine that's a laser sorter. Every bean goes and a laser hits it and depending on the color, it puts it in a different pile. That's all the ways um, that we separate the quality. But what's really interesting for the highest quality coffee, for, for those of you that are real coffee snobs and really like the good stuff and wanna pay for the good stuff, we actually have, we employ two to 300 women every year to pick every bean by hand. And you can see in the bottom corner, there's one of our workers and you can see the women behind them. They're literally picking every bean. And only the human eye can detect deficiencies in these beans that these women see every day. What's interesting, you know, as, as Western businessmen and trying to figure out how to help that process. We thought we would do a lot of things to make it more efficient. And we didn't really like the idea of women sitting on the, on, on the ground. It just didn't seem fair to us. And we invested a lot of money and time trying to make a more efficient process. And we brought in these tables from Central America. We brought in this fluorescent light and we had them sit up on a table and they hated it. <laughs> they didn't want to do it. And our problem was we didn't ask any questions about what they actually thought. And they actually enjoy sitting on the ground. They actually enjoy getting to visit with one another. And, and it, typical Western thought. You know, we, we think uh, the, the most efficient way is the way we think it should be because that's what we read in a book one time, you know. Um, <laughs> but it, it, it is, uh, it's a very important part of the process. Regina, here on the left, she's a certified Q-grade cupper. She could get a job with any roaster here in the U.S. She cups every lot of coffee that comes into our facility or goes out. She has a team. And uh, she is very gifted at keeping our quality <clears throat> and um, our um, consistency through our, through our meal every day. As we went through all this process of learning coffee and trying to uh, build a business, and, and we're um, unashamedly a for-profit business, we're about making money. But why, why we're about making money is we like to take that money and reinvest it back in what we're doing in Rwanda and build our business. But as we started um, with this facility, one of the interesting things, and, and it's always funny how some of the most simple things are always the most impactful, but what we found out as we walked through the facility for the first time, there were no restrooms and there were no showers. And as we were walking around just talking, we asked, where do these women that, that are here all day long, where do they go to the restroom? And the answer was they go outside the gates and, and find a place to go. You know, that didn't. It didn't sit well with us. And uh, so we built bathrooms. We built showers for the guys. The guys uh, that worked for us there, they moved bags of coffee, 150-pound bags on their shoulders every day. I did it one day with them, and I paid a heavy price uh, for trying to be tough and work with those guys. But they get, uh, it's, it's interesting, they get obviously really dirty, really sweaty, and they work hard. And when they're done, they go to the showers that we built. And uh, when I was there one day, one of them came out and he was dressed in his, his coat and he was dressed to the nines after a hard day's work. And on the outside of his arm, he had an armband with his, our company's ID tag. And I got an interpreter over and I said, what is he, why is he wearing his tag home? You know, why is he getting on the bus with that? And, and he responded, he said, because I'm proud to work here. You know, I'm, a, I'm, I'm excited about where I work. And you know, it was, it was just these little things about how we treat people, the dignity, that we share that has been uh, most important to us um, as we've tried to build this business is the little things you don't think about are always the most meaningful. A couple other situations where that's occurred to us and we've um, taken the time to ask the right questions. There's three photos here. The, the photo at the top left is a local community uh, water facility I'm not sure who even built it, if it was the government or an NGO or whatever, but you can see it was in ill repair, and these children were coming to, to um, get water that obviously wasn't clean, wasn't sanitary. 
And this was actually right below a coffee washing station that we bought out of bankruptcy. And it wasn't on our property, but it just um, it didn't sit well with us again to see these kids getting coming walking miles a day to get water and then it being dirty water. And so we partnered with a, with a company um, that, that you would all know that uh, helped us raise some money to put in what you see on the right. That's the same place after it was uh, uh, rejuvenated with clean water and um, obviously um, concrete where all the runoff would, would get out of the way and, and the, the kids would not be sticking their jerry cans in the, in the dirty water to get water. And again, we, we just did it because it was something nearby. We, we noticed it was a problem. We found someone to help us pay for it. And um, what was really neat about it from a, just a business perspective was you can't imagine the impact it had on the community. We, we were able, after we rejuvenated the water, we got twice as much coffee brought to our washing station as we did the year before. Um, and that was because the, the people in the community were appreciative that we actually um, asked them for what we could do to help them rather than just go about our business as usual. And what you see in the bottom left here, this is a, a very um, similar situation, but a whole different problem. Um, if you've ever traveled to Africa, every hillside has a different problem. Uh, you, you can't, there's not a one size fits all. And so up in the eastern part of Rwanda, there was a community that had a protein deficiency. The, the kids, you could tell they were malnourished. Um, it was, a, it was a, a noticeable problem. And we partnered with Heifer International um, here in Little Rock and sent over 20 cows to give to the community where we bought our coffee. And uh, uh, we hired a veterinarian to take care of the cattle because uh, that was, again, something we didn't really think about till we got 20 cows on the ground and realized we didn't know how to take care of them. <laughs> so now we've got a veterinarian on, on staff of a coffee company, which is somewhat interesting, but taking care of our cattle. And, and the same thing happened. We ended up getting so much more coffee delivered to our washing station than we ever thought we would have. I think, again, because we, we asked questions, saw a need, and addressed that. And we're using the profits of our company to do this. And so that's why it's, for us, it's very important to operate with a for-profit mindset, not because we're looking to get rich, but because we need that money to do other things. And uh, we're reinvesting it um, as closely back to the people that are helping us out as we can. And so, now, if you're in this room, you, you probably all have a passion to make a difference and want to do something um, in the world bigger and beyond yourself. You know, honestly, I never thought much about that really until I got that random phone call that day to, to go to Rwanda. Um, so I hate to admit that about myself, but it's true. Um, but uh, one thing um, I've learned over the last nine years and sort of this new adventure in my life I never thought I'd be on is that I see a lot of, I've seen a lot of people, when we lived in Rwanda in particular, a lot of people came through Rwanda that had um, a wonderful resume, had so much passion to help the poor, that wanted to do so many things, and, and they were over there with people they were bringing over, maybe they had given them money, um, staff members, whatever. But what was interesting is they never took the time to actually ask the people they were trying to help, what do you need? And... Um, I've seen a lot of programs just never get off the ground because they never really took the time to listen. And if I can encourage any of you, if you have a passion to want to engage with people from another culture, you have to take the time to listen. And um, it's, a, it's imperative because every time we've not taken the time to listen and thought we had a solution on our own that was going to be this wonderful thing, it ended up being a complete failure. And if we can have any success that we can look to, it's because we actually took the time to ask the questions and to find um, the right need and address it as they would like us to rather than how we would want to. It's very important. For me, personally, you know, I work in Little Rock and deal with all the things we deal with in our culture every day. And uh, I'm only lucky enough to get back to Rwanda two or three times a year, and that's always my favorite part of my job. I, I don't like being away from the family, but I do like going over there and we spend a lot of time talking to farmers we spend we'll spend four or five hours in a conversation with a group of farmers that probably could take 10 minutes if we could talk the same language and have the same culture so it's <laughs> it's a it's a challenge but it's the best thing we do it's the hardest and best thing we do is to talk to the farmers and see what can we do to help them even more 
And I'm always encouraged. These are three of our employees at our plant. And I always, um, when I'm feeling uh, maybe selfish or a little self-absorbed in my own world, I can always pull up these photos and be reminded, these guys are just like me. They're trying to take care of their families. They're working hard. And it, it provides me that needed inspiration to continue to know um, why I do what I do. So thank you.